So good evening and welcome. So welcome to the 27th season of Norwich University's Military Writers Symposium in Northfield, Vermont. It's an absolute pleasure to have each of you here. The symposium is a signature event of Norwich University's Peace and War Center, and it's the only event of its kind in an American university. It has brought some of the most prominent military intelligence, international affairs writers of our time to central Vermont. It's designed to educate, enlighten, challenge, and inspire. The symposium is designed to be relevant and it tackles significant issues head on. So a brief history. In 1996, the symposium was conceived by co-founders W.E.B. Griffith and Carlo Deste with support of former North President Major General Russell Todd, U.S. Army retired. Its inspiration was to bring influential writers to North University. So in the past, we focused on varied subjects that range from cyber warfare, World War I, PTSD, the weaponizations of water, the impact of World War I, Iraq, Afghanistan. This year, we focus on the Arctic, specifically the theme global conflict or cooperation evolving Arctic security. So to my left, you have some of the globe's leading experts on the subject, and we are honored and privileged to have them with you and to sit before you. So before I introduce the moderator, I would like to recognize and thank several people who make tonight and this event possible. When I call your name, please stand. Norwich President University, Mark Anarumo, who is in the back, sir. Thank you so much for your, your support throughout this event. Provost Fitzhugh, our Kobe Award winners, Dr. Steve Sodergren and Mark Trainer. Please stand just to be recognized. Thank you very much. You may have a seat. I'd also like to thank those alumni and supporters who are both on and off campus to make this event possible. We certainly appreciate your talents, your time, and your treasure. I'd also like to thank the Pritzker Military Museum and Library. Their partnership has made this event uh, possible. We certainly appreciate their cooperation. They definitely enhance our educational opportunities, both for on-campus and off-campus activities. I would also like to thank those of you that are joining online. We certainly appreciate you being with us this evening. So finally, as I look to each of you standing before me, whether you're a civilian or a cadet, this event is for you. Many of you in the future, you'll be leading others in complex and challenging environments, in places and situations right now you can't imagine. Some of them could be the Arctic. That's why you're here, and that's why we're here. The Arctic may be not on your radar at all, maybe something you haven't ever thought about, but it's something you certainly would, and this is why we're having this event, and this is why we want you to be aware of what's going on to the north. The symposium, it's meant to make you aware and to be proactive cognitively of a very fluid situational environment. So a few housekeeping rules before we begin. One, please make sure your cell phones are off. There will be a time for Q&A session at the end, so as you're hearing the panel proceed, think of a question. When you see Mike's position to your left and to your right, you can go ahead and start lining up and have your questions um, answered. We are very fortunate to have our moderator today, Master Sergeant U.S. Army reti retired Troy Buford. Just a brief uh, background on Professor Buford. He holds a Master's of Arts in Arctic Policy and is currently completing a PhD program focused on Arctic defense strategy and international law. He is the director of the University of Alaska Fairbanks Center for Arctic Security and Resilience. As a defense contractor, he is co-principal investigators for the Department of Defense Arctic Defense and Security Orientation Program with U.S. NORTHCOM and ALCOM. He's a network coordinator for the North American and Arctic Defense and Security Network, NADSEN, and a non-resident research fellow with the Center for Defense and Security Studies in the University of Manitoba. He works with NATO, the Arctic Council, and is a sought-out speaker. He's also a frequent speaker on international Arctic events. He's well-published and he regularly engages with the media. It's my honor and privilege to welcome Professor Troy Buffard to the stage. The floor is yours, sir. Good 
Good evening, everyone, and thank you for being here. President Anamorma, Provost, esteemed guests, and especially the Norwich military cadets who have chosen the difficult path to join the future leaders of the world's most powerful and dignified military in honorable service to this nation. It is a profound honor to be in front of such a distinguished company, including yesterday's proven veterans, today's expert warriors, and tomorrow's brilliant leaders. Thank you for sharing your time with us and allowing us the opportunity to offer thoughts and perspectives concerning today's topics, the, the Arctic and global competition. I'd like to introduce our panel to you. You have information in front of you in the program, but there's some stuff that's not there. Um, it's not in the program. You may not know it. It's not on the internet. But I have a good, uh, a meaningful connection with each of the panel members. They've helped me to improve and develop my writing skills. They've been inspiring to me for many, many years. Not by design. It just happens that this panel uh, has has meaningful connection to me, and I'd like to add a little bit more about their background. Dr. Whitney Lockenbauer, in the last couple of years, no one has supported and propelled my professional academic development like my friend and colleague, Dr. Whitney Lockenbauer. Whitney has shown me what it means to be an ambitious and contributing intellectual, a world-class thinker, a thoughtful mentor, and empowering enabler for individual potential. My relatively new journey into scholarship will forever benefit from his example. He's a machine. I've never seen anyone produce as much as he does. Whitney's inspiration and professional work influences many, including many of the Northern Defense Commands around the Circumpolar North, the Canadian Rangers throughout his home country, and the network of academics and executive practitioners on the continent. Simply put, Whitney is an absolute scholar, force of nature for the North American Arctic. Dr. James Kraska is one of the very first experts I ever heard of when I began my journey into the world of Arctic security long ago. I typed his name, I typed Arctic security in Google, and his name popped up first. And I was reminded of his book when I saw it today on the table. It was one of the first books I ever read on Arctic security. I got a sense of what it meant to be a true expert by reading his publications. His portfolio and activities are sophisticated and influential in all the right ways. His work inspired and frightened me at the same time, because I started to learn what it meant to be a responsible and accountable for the information involving some of the most difficult issues, challenging the world. He has mentored and supported development of my own work, including maritime law, of which he is one of the world's foremost authorities. In addition, Dr. Kraska offer, also offers substantial expertise concerning another leading adversarial challenge to the West, China. <coughs> Sam, I've been extremely fortunate to know Sam for many years and have had the distinct pleasure of knowing his family over time, including his absolute superhuman wife, Kim, his two sons, Tolf and Coco, his mom, Jeannie, the very definition of a loving family matriarch. His father, Clarence, who once received a very prestigious award from, the president, from President Obama for his unprecedented stewardship of the Yukon Flats. His sister, Stephanie, and his brothers, Dacho and Edward. Sam has walked in several worlds. His identity is complex and impressive. He is a West Point graduate, an infantry officer, and a member of the U.S. Special Forces. Like Lieutenant Colonel Morris, also, he is a U.S. Ranger. Sam is a Gwich'in warrior and a longtime international delegate of the Arctic Council, the highest level Arctic international forum in the world. This evening, you'll learn much from him. Additionally, I'd strongly encourage you to ask him about leadership and how his courage is the reason that the tallest mountain in North America was renamed to Denali. I'm able to be here today as an invited guest largely because of the support of this panel. Mentorship and friendship of James, Sam, and Whitney, I'll never forget. With that, I'd like to turn over to the panel, uh, starting with Sam, for opening remarks, uh, and then we'll roll into question and answer session. I'll point up the map a little bit.
all the tracks in my eyes, and I look up, there's a moose standing right there. I think that was a big moose. I go to the next lake, my brother-in-law is waiting there. He said, hey, do you see the moose? I said, I saw that moose, he was standing right there. He said, let's go back and shoot him. And I said, hey, we said we're going caribou hunting. And the moose is trying to pull us off the trail. I said, we went caribou hunting, we went caribou and then years later, as I was thinking about getting out of the military, I was driving down the road, I was out of the National Station at Fort Campbell. And I was, you know, I told my boss I was going to get out, you know, but all of a sudden, all these great jobs started popping up. And they're like, hey, you can go do this other job. You know, you don't have to go to Fort Polk, Louisiana. You can go over here and work with these people and do plain clothes and stuff. And I was like, that sounds pretty cool. I'd like to do that. I was like, wait a second. They're trying to throw me off the path. <laughs> and I was like, maybe this is what that old man was talking about this whole time. Just, he always knows. You know, when I was growing up, I didn't speak my native language. You know, did you kind of language I was just speaking, which I didn't speak and learn it as an adult. And so when I was growing up, I really didn't appreciate the elders that we had um, in our communities because they didn't speak English very well. They just spoke at like maybe like a, you know, like a, like a little child who speak English. <laughs> so very complicated topics and very complicated uh, concepts that we wanted to talk about, but we didn't talk about with them because they didn't speak English well and I didn't speak with them. And so I never really appreciated their knowledge until I learned the language. And so I actually, I've gone back and listened to old recordings of these people from, from 40, 50 years ago and hear the things that they had to say very, very complicated concepts that they talk about and a lot of knowledge of any of those stories, a lot of traditional knowledge. And so, you know, one of the things that we're told in, when you're in the military is to know your operational environment. You've got to know your operational environment. That's a critical aspect when you're, when you're fighting or you're thinking about creating a plan is knowing your operational environment. In the Arctic, Nobody knows the operational environment better than the indigenous people. Period. You will not know the operational environment better than the indigenous people of the Arctic. You just won't. And if you don't understand the language or take the time to understand the people, you'll never have access to the knowledge that's going to allow you to understand that environment. And that doesn't just apply to the indigenous people of Alaska, Canada, Greenland, Scandinavia. It also applies to the indigenous people of Russia as well. There are indigenous people in Russia. So, you know, if you look at them, you think they're Native American. Perhaps that's what we think. So, you know, one of the things we talk about within uh, special forces because they say, you work by, with, and through indigenous people. Uh, work by, with, and through indigenous people. How are you going to be able to do that? Then? Well, first of all, why do we do that? Why do we do that? Because it leverages available knowledge and manpower. That's one of the things. But the other piece of it is, in order to be able to do that, you have to familiarize yourself with the indigenous people. You can't just go in there and think that the customs that you have and the means of communication that you use are going to resonate with those people that are going to be very important to your success. You know, this conference, we talk about cooperation or conflict. I will tell you this, from an indigenous standpoint, there is a reason why there's really, really in Alaska, I mean, primarily, you have only indigenous communities on the road system. You have a lot of people that are not native and moved to Alaska and they try to survive on their own. But they really don't, they, they can do it for a couple of years, but they don't last very long. And the reason is because the most fundamental thing about being successful in the Arctic is cooperation. Everybody needs to support everyone. That's it. My brother, he was hunting a couple of years back, I won't mention which one, because it's embarrassed. But he broke down, we both broke down. 
my father was my father was going to go to gas and tell me rules. And sure enough, you know, ran out of gas, broke down. And this guy my brother didn't like turned the corner and there he was. These, these guys don't like each other. They come discuss. But the guy sees him and he pulls over and he picks him up and they go back to town. Even though they don't like each other. That's how it is in the army. The only way to be successful up there is to cooperate. You probably heard the term here since you've been here, cooperate and graduate. Maybe, maybe not. All right? Cooperate and graduate. In the yard, to survive, just to survive, I'm not talking about going beyond that, but to survive, you have to cooperate. And you have to understand your operational environment. Don't be a detriment to your units when you go to these places because you're unprepared. Right now, you're in the best place you can possibly be to be prepared, to prepare yourselves for the challenges here in the future when it comes to conflict. And whether it be conflict or cooperation in the Arctic, it doesn't matter because all of you, you know, you hear it, you hear it from your instructors, and you're like, yeah, yeah, whatever. I will tell you that you will be the leaders of this country in the future. And that's going to happen whether you want to be or not. You will be called upon. You will be called upon to serve. You've already been called upon. And you will be called upon, and you need to be prepared. So know your operational environment. Respect the indigenous knowledge that's out there and leverage it to the best of your ability. Remember that our indigenous people, especially our native people of Alaska, want to support and see the success of our military out there. And so make sure that you respect them and respect the knowledge that they have. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm reminded of much of what Sam just mentioned is, is not new to us. Um, as the Arctic as this emerging operational contested environment to some extent that we'll talk about more tonight is not unlike what we went through in the desert. And we went in assuming too much, not knowing, not learning, not listening, not thinking. And it cost us dearly. So we're now in the Arctic and this is our home and we're trying to uh, adapt to this as quick as possible and it's a little different in the Arctic. In terms of this, we're seeing not only the military, but the, you know, when it comes to indigenous and non-indigenous working together, how do we even talk to each other? That's kind of an issue, but we're trying to do that. And, and this is part of uh, the military, DOD, defense agencies, diplomats, researchers, um, but we're learning that if we just listen a little, a little harder, they have ways of knowing. Indigenous peoples have ways of knowing that one way or another, we're going to listen to, we're going to use it and to get to success. And until we do, and we listen to that, those ways of knowing, we're not going to be successful. Luckily, we kind of have a purposive environment to do this and some time. And I'm seeing good, good stuff happen here. So thank you, Sam. Dr. Kreska. Thank you. So the, the Arctic region is a the Arctic region is a perfect example of cooperation and conflict. And what I suggest is that you're going to face both of those sometimes in the same location. China is the greatest pacing threat for the United States. It's the only multi-dimensional threat which has economic power, it has military power, as well as even uh, political power. The Chinese governance model uh, that's reflected in Confucian tradition and is popular in Asia is championed by 
China and other countries. For example, China's claim of governance superiority in its response to the COVID pandemic and uh, how uh, they've been able to deal effectively with that. So this is the multi-dimensional pacing threat for the United States and our friends and allies throughout the globe. The Arctic region is a perfect example of both cooperation and to be ready simultaneously for the potential for conflict. China regards itself as a, quote, near Arctic state, a near Arctic state. And rather than being on the periphery of the Arctic region, China has unapologetically inserted itself into the fabric of Arctic governance and Arctic power. China uh, joined as an observer the Arctic Council in 2013, and it also issued a comprehensive foreign ministry white paper on Arctic policy in 2018. Some very interesting aspects to this paper. So China accepts that the Arctic region, like all of the world, is governed by the Charter of the United Nations. Also, the Arctic is an ocean, and so those aspects that are maritime are governed by the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. And there are some other international agreements that apply in the Arctic, such as the Spitsbergen Treaty, which allows some 40 states to have access to the Svalbard Archipelago that is uh, part of Norway. But under this treaty, uh, 40 states, including China, can fish and hunt and access those islands for mineral rights, for mining. And, and China wants to be part of this and, and asserts that it is. It also asserts a special position or a special right because it is a member of the Permanent Five of the UN Security Council, one of only five thermonuclear powers, that is, uh, states that have not just nuclear weapons, but a hydrogen bomb. So China looks to these govern governance institutions and mechanisms and says that it will comply with them, and that's, that's a good news story. China's interested in marine scientific research, in freedom of navigation and overflight, fishing and submarine cables, uh, pipelines, access to minerals on the international seabed area. China claims the rights to all of these under these treaties, principally the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. And in fact, China does have a legitimate right as a member of uh, these institutions to claim uh, access to the Arctic region. China is interested in advancing science on climate change and in participating in regional governance and global governance that affects the Arctic. And uh, it, it also uh, claims usage for the sea routes, which it names as the Northwest Passage through Canada, our neighbor and our ally, the Northern Sea Route through Russia, and a transpolar route through the middle of the Arctic Ocean. And China claims access to all of those as part of its right of freedom of navigation and overflow. China says that these routes are going to have a, quote, huge impact on the global economy and on the Chinese economy, Chinese uh, development, as well as energy. And it has incorporated these into its concept of a polar silk road, part of the Belt Road Initiative, where China seeks to be the hub of global trade that connects the, the East, Korea, Japan, China, and other countries uh, to, the, to the West, Europe and North and South America. And so China claims that the Arctic Ocean is going to be part of this Belt Road Initiative, the greatest global infrastructure network in the history of mankind. <laughs> So China it has capital, technology, it's got a huge market, and it also claims, quote, knowledge and experience unique to the Arctic that it, that it seeks to uh, apply and exploit and be respected uh, for. So they want to facilitate economic and social progress in the Arctic region. 
in the Arctic states. And uh, they're already present there. One of the, they're one of the major uh, groups of delega delegations for marine scientific research in the region and also in Svalbard Archipelago. And their, go their goals are some of the goals that we share, such as understanding and being more resilient and responsive to mm -hmm. climate change, to understand the science, not just in the climate, but also the biology and the geophysical environment. Uh, China seeks to develop technology, uh, in particular green energy, the same types of things that are attractive to, to us. China also insists on its right to participate, though, in the governance in this region, and we should be satisfied somewhat that China represents that it's committed to the frameworks that exist, the UN Charter, the Law of the Sea Convention, and these other agreements. In particular, China is very active at the UN Specialized Agency for Maritime Matters, the International Maritime Organization. It's also active in the UN Framework on Climate Change. It supports the Kyoto Protocol uh, toward these goals. China also joined a 2019 fishing moratorium on fishing in the central Arctic Ocean beyond the, the waters of the, of the coastal states. China also seeks finally to, to work out new rules for marine genetic resources. These are uh, chemosynthetic organisms that collect around seabed hydrothermal vents, and they're the most unique life form on Earth. They don't require the sun's energy for life. Uh, totally unknown until just a few decades ago. And each of these communities on the deep seabed, we believe, are unique. They have unique genetic properties and could be the next cure for cancer down there 5,000 meters <coughs> below the surface of the water. China wants to participate in that, and it insists on having a, quote, fair and equitable sharing of the benefits. So, of course, the West is, are, are the leaders in biotechnology and medical technology, and China is working with other countries to insist on a share of that. Well, it's a good news and a mixed story because China uh, respects the Arctic Council and, and observes the agreements, the treaties that the Arctic Council has negotiated, even though China is only an observer, it's not a, uh, a participant. Uh, there's a, agreements on search and rescue for aviation and, uh, and surface ships. There's an agreement on oil pollution, another on marine science. China also has bilateral agreements with the United States, with Iceland, Russia, and there's a trilateral agreement with Korea and Japan and China for work in the Arctic. So there is cooperation but there's also the prospect of potentially of conflict or at least cooperation with uh, an eye on, uh, on trust mechanisms and on the, the level of investment that the Arctic states, the United States and, and the other Arctic states, uh, can act with China. Because China's acceptance of the rules in the Arctic that are liberal and open and benefit states, non-Arctic states, such as China. Also apply in areas near China, such as the South China Sea, the East China Sea, the Mid-Pacific Ocean, the Indian Ocean, the South Pacific, where China has, for example, huge fishing fleets that are poaching uh, fish off the coast of Ecuador. Uh, in waters under Ecuador's jurisdiction. So China has a global presence, and it's great that China is at the table and participating in the, the mechanisms for Arctic governance. But this is in contrast to China's lack of compliance, non-compliance, 
with these same agreements in areas that are closer to China. And so this raises the prospect of, of course, a double standard and the likelihood of tension. That's why, as leaders, you'll be confronted with not a binary choice of will there be conflict or will there be cooperation. There will be, there will be cooperation, and there also <coughs> is always the possibility that you have to prepare for conflict. Thank you. Thanks to the organizers, thanks to Norwich University for being wonderful hosts. It is a great privilege to be able to, to share some ideas with all of you and reminding all of you, this event is for you. So looking forward to our conversations. Sam, Mossy, for your insights, <laughs> James, for yours, and, and thanks, Troy, for, for hosting here. I come to this topic from various perspectives and levels of analysis. And I agree very much that there's also often a false binary set up asking whether we should frame the Arctic or expect that the Arctic will become a zone of conflict or cooperation. In a competitive world, this is a false binary. We have and we should expect, as we've just heard, cooperation and competition in the Arctic within a world of similar dynamics. So competition between Arctic states and with non-Arctic states will continue, but it does not mean that we are equally vulnerable in or across all domains, scales, and levels or that conflict is inevitable. There's also a tendency to treat what goes on at the international level <coughs> as separate from what's happening in the Arctic as a region. And the dramatic transformations in the environment, the ways of life for the people who live there, as Sam has so eloquently shared with us this morning and tonight, must be on our minds. I've been very privileged over the last couple of decades to have traveled extensively in the Canadian Arctic and Canadian ranges reserve members of our Canadian Armed Forces who serve in a non-kinetic role as the eyes, ears, and voice of their home communities in the military, and then the military's voice in their communities, that essential dialogue and connectedness that Sam amplified for us. This morning I talked a bit about the benefits when we're thinking about the Arctic in terms of the threat environment, to distinguishing between threats through the Arctic, threats in the Arctic, or threats to the Arctic. I think there's a conceptual danger of treating all threats the same and not being attentive to what kind of threats we're talking about and what exactly our competitors are targeting in the Arctic. So I want to take a few minutes here and just share with you what I see as six myths about Arctic defense and security to persist in 2021. First is that Arctic state sovereignty, so the sovereignty of states like the United States or Canada where I come from, is on thinning ice that somehow we're facing the risk of losing our Arctic territory or our sovereign rights to offshore resources because the cryosphere is changing, because the ice is melting. This idea is implied in many of the pithy sentences that we see starting Arctic strategies or policy statements that bundle together resurgent major power competition, climate change, uncertain boundaries, increasingly accessible resources, shipping routes we just heard about, emerging technologies, all as drivers of rising Arctic defense concerns. But conflict emanating from growing major power competition at the global scale that spills over into the Arctic is a very different set of causes, I would argue, than thinking about sovereignty threats in the Arctic as actually precipitating or causing conflict. Long-standing well-managed, comparatively minor disputes or differences in legal positions in the Arctic don't keep me up at night. I want to emphasize we need to be more precise in identifying which type of threats in which domains or across which domains are heightening the risk of conflict and which aspects of these threats are specifically Arctic and which ones do we best manage at the global strategic level. So I think that Arctic states like the United States needs to adopt more coherent, more precise strategic messaging about the nature of the changing Arctic security environment. The second myth, as I see it, is that climate change and access to Arctic resources and uncertainty over Arctic boundaries are driving the hard security agenda in the North American Arctic right now, as we find ourselves immersed in this era of the emerging great power competition. I'd suggest to you it's dynamics outside of the circumpolar Arctic that are really driving competition 
and heightening the risk of miscommunication or unintended escalation. So I see a strong analytic value in distinguishing between threats that pass through or over the Arctic. We can think like bombers and missiles or glide vehicles that pass through Arctic airspace or aerospace or the space above the Arctic, outer space above the Arctic. Distinguishing between these threats and those that are from or are threats to the Arctic that actually arise from Arctic regional dynamics. So I suggest that the dominant variables in play right now are grand strategic rather than regional Arctic ones. And a key one is technology in the form of faster, more maneuverable delivery systems, as well as vulnerabilities that we face in the cyber and influence domains, right? Something that Norwich University specializes in studying. Hyperglide weapons, the latest generation of cruise missiles, are not affected by changing Arctic environmental conditions. Nor is the ability for adversaries to try and polarize debate using social media or cyberspace or their state-controlled news media. Now, I've been talking about the Arctic in this sweeping way like our map shows, it's the single space, which is ironic because the third myth I want to share with you is the idea that the Arctic is a single geostrategic theater. I'd highlight there are very significant differences between the Eurasian Arctic, the European Arctic, the North American Arctic. There are obviously vast distances between them in certain domains where this applies. And this makes it essential that we not get caught up in generalizing about Arctic threats as if those in one part of the Arctic are the same all across the Arctic inherently. The immediate threats posed by the Russian army to its European Arctic neighbors with shared land borders, for example, are different than those posed to certainly Canada, I would argue even the United States. We also need to think about the bearing strength, right, between Alaska and Russia, you see on the left-hand side of your map, or the Greenland, Iceland, United Kingdom, Norway gap, if you think of, of Europe and that access point to the North Atlantic. I think we need to think about these as access routes to the North Pacific, to the North Atlantic, without getting too fixated on them as Arctic spaces. And what they offer as ways out of dilemmas for countries like China, who could find themselves constrained or contained in Asia in conflicts going on, say, with India, where this would offer them a way out. So it's important that we not look at things only through a circumpolar lens and around the North Pole lens, but also think globally. The fourth myth is that the Russians have aspirations to conquer Arctic territory from rival states, that their preponderance of icebreakers, their expanding footprint of Arctic bases and units, and their self-perception as the foremost Arctic nation means that they think they could win in an Arctic conflict. No way. They want to flex their muscles in the Arctic for strategic effect, sure. The Kremlin knows it cannot win in an Arctic war, especially against the United States. Russian officials often admit, Troy, correct me if I'm wrong, that the US and NATO are militarily superior. They can't win in a conventional peer-to-peer -peer conflict. So I think we need to really focus on hybrid below the threshold and geopolitical spaces, first and foremost, when we're thinking about Russia as an Arctic competitor. The fifth myth, and this is building off of some of what you said, James, quickly, is that China is a peer competitor in the Arctic. It's a competitor to the Arctic states in several respects, but it is not a peer in the Arctic. And serious analysts in China recognize this, as does that Arctic policy released in 2018. So yes, China promotes itself as a near-Arctic state, but this invented status doesn't give it any priority status over any other non-Arctic state actor in terms of international rights or access. So I think we must be careful not to dedicate disproportionate attention to China's potential aspirations in, say, the maritime domain, if this means redirecting resources away from areas where we are certain that China has core strategic interests, capabilities, and revisionist intentions, read South China Sea. Don't let the Arctic moose distract us from the caribou that China is actually seeking. And last is the myth that the Arctic is somehow exceptional in the world of international affairs. This idea takes several forms. The classic one is that the Arctic is uniquely peaceful and cooperative and should and could be kept separate from broader international dynamics. I think, quite frankly, this is naive in a globalized world. I think that this ideal 
of a purely exceptional cooperative Arctic space is what is in danger, much more than actual peace and stability in the circumpolar world. Another way of thinking about this is that the Arctic is somehow exceptionally vulnerable or becoming exceptionally unstable or explosive. This kind of thinking tends to overlook or forget the broader grand strategic implications that such moves in the Arctic would have for all of the actors and protagonists involved. So climate change is amplifying certain types of Arctic threats in certain domains, and it's certainly changing the face of the region for its inhabitants and for the international community. But it doesn't mean that heightened international interest and even competition is inherently going to negate cooperation or bring about conflict. Some of these ideas might be provocative, but I look forward to the discussion and especially hearing your questions. And, and please feel free to challenge me on any or all of these. James and Whitney just spoke about, what does that have to do with you? A lot of this stuff sounds like the purview of the State Department, foreign affairs, diplomats, for them to manage. What does this have to do with DOD? I'll tell you for one thing, freedom of navigation, that is something that is a shared responsibility with DOD and State Department. Other things, you can expect major issues in competitive environments for DOD to continue and maintain a supporting role. We do this constantly. It's sometimes largely not visible to the public, uh, but you can expect this to happen. What you can expect in the future, especially where, when we're going up against growing powers like China and Russia, who have global ambitions, is for them to increasingly frustrate us with international norms, laws, stuff that Dr. Kraska talked about push those to the edge, not cross the line necessarily, but interpret and implement and use those to their advantage in ways we've never seen before. To push us into those zones of miscalculation right, after elevating, escalating issues. This is what you can expect in the future. More sophisticated use of this is happening in the South China Sea. And in the end, what our adversaries are looking for us to do is to make a mistake. If we make that first step, that first mistake, that justifies what could be very bad follow-on actions. And this is kind of the world we're seeing develop in front of us that you're going to inherit as leaders. In supporting roles, you might find yourself someplace on the earth, including the Arctic, where you get pulled very rapidly into a mistake. And that's what our adversaries would like. So the more we learn, the more you can be prepared, and more of be part of the solution. So before we get into questions from the audience, I got one question for a panel directly for the cadets. Future leaders, right? Uh, from a military perspective, James, Sam, what do you know now that you wish you had known when you came in the military? And how would you apply that? And Whitney, from an academic perspective, we're all continuing students for life. What do you know now that we should you had known when you began, and how would you apply it? So, I guess there's there's two things. I don't know if you can hear me very well. Um, <laughs> I had no idea how important being able to write well actually mattered. <laughs> that sounds kind of crazy, but it's true. Um, you know, I, I'll be honest. I grew up in a small village. And uh, like I said, a lot of people didn't speak English as their first language, so we what we call village English, and you probably hear a little bit of an accent that I have. Um, and so I you know, didn't really take writing seriously until I actually, I didn't take writing seriously until I went into Special Forces. And I'll tell you the most important thing that I did pretty much the entire time that I was a Special Forces team leader, I was on an OEA, on Operational Detachment Alpha, for 37 months. And uh, in that time, I did two tours with that ODA and an additional um, counter -nar narcotics tour uh, in the country. And um, the most important thing I did was write my daily sit rep. And it's kind of crazy. You're like, whatever, man. I'm like, I got it. Writing is important. My instructors tell me that. This is what happened to me. I had a good friend. He was a company commander, infantry unit. We were in Iraq. And 
he, um, he said, I got this problem. These guys I work with are called the Sons of Iraq. They're not getting paid. It's been three months since they got, they've gotten paid. They're about to all quit. And it's going to be a massive, massive problem within my sector because they're not going to provide security anymore. I said, okay, that's interesting. I'll send one of my guys over. So I sent a, one of my NCOs over them, and he went out, came back, and I said, hey, Phil, what did you see? And he said, well, oh, sorry. <laughs> Anyways, it's like, what did you see? And he said, he said, they're not getting paid. They're probably going to quit soon, and this is what's going to happen if they quit. I said, okay. And so I wrote it up in a report, and I said, hey, you know, here's my cigarette. The next day, I get an email. It's from my buddy. And it's a, it's a, he forwarded an email to me. And so I had to go all the way to the bottom, right? And it was an email that his battalion commander sent him. And I was like, oh. And then I go to the next one, it's from the brigade commander. And I go to the next one, and it's from the division commander. And then underneath the word, the division commander, who's in charge of thousands and thousands of soldiers, was a blurb from my sit rabbit. And then it said underneath it, to the brigade commanders, all full bird colonels, it said, you have 24 hours to fix this. And then I went down to the battalion commanders and it says, you've got 24, less than 24 hours to fix this. And then it went to all those company commanders and they said, you better fix this now. And guess what? That's what they did and all those guys got paid. It's because I wrote that one report and I wrote it well. And it really hit me that everybody was, they actually were reading what I was writing and that it mattered. And that I needed to be able to clearly communicate what the problem was and how to solve that problem. At least provide recommendations. And so that was, that was a pretty massive thing for me to take away. And I, I don't think I quite fully appreciated that when I was a cadet, I'll be honest. The other thing I didn't appreciate as a cadet was that I would be, kind of in the position that I am now, where we're, here we are, we're talking about international affairs. So when I was a student, actually it was almost 20 years ago, it'll be 20 years ago this month, uh, I went to something called the Student Council on U.S. Affairs, they called it SCUSA. It was, a, it was a conference that they had um, when I was a kid. And we, you know, there was like, it was the, I can't remember the topic, it was like global security in the 21st century. You know, this was in 2001. So this is right after September 11th happened, and we were going to talk about this. And so there we were, we were a group of students, and we were like, we don't know, what do we know? You know, we're going to write out some things and put out this like white paper and put out our ideas of how we would solve these problems. Well, what I didn't realize is all the people that were involved in that conference years later would still be involved, and then the next thing you know, you're sitting across from the Secretary of State talking about the J Treaty. That's what happened to me. I looked across the table, there was John Kerry. I looked across the table, it was Rex Tillerson. Right? That's going to happen to you. You're going to be in that position. And so your time here as cadets, there are a lot of great opportunities that are being presented in front of you. And you have a lot of things that you have to balance. I understand that. You're busy people. You probably get like five hours of sleep a night if you're lucky. I understand that. But when the opportunity comes to be involved in, in especially these things where you're, you're talking about international affairs, you're trying to come up with solutions, get involved. You might not have the right solution, that doesn't matter. You need to understand the process. Be a part of the process. And then when it's your time, because you will get tapped at some point, you will be ready to be a part of that process. Thank you. So we didn't coordinate at all these comments, but one of the, one of the thoughts, uh, I've three things. The first is when I was an undergraduate, uh, I thought that English and writing English was just something that sort of came along. And so I wanted to do another major, international relations, and I thought, well, I'll be able to sort of pick it up as I go along. So I've written, I don't know, probably 75 articles and 10 or so books. I just cleared my last page proofs for a book, and I'm still looking up English. On the final page, these are, these are proofs that I've already read, 
and then sent to the publisher, and they come back to me for uh, for a final look, and I'm still looking up and improving and perfecting the English. And I probably shouldn't have made fun of the English majors like I did. <laughs> Uh, and so you don't have to be an English major, but you have to, you have to be a, a part-time. You have to, uh, everything that you write, uh, you have to perfect it now and learn the English, or you will be looking it up when you're 50 or 55. And so, uh, you know, that, this is one thing. Get uh, the elements of style, Zinsser on writing well, uh, the Little Brown Handbook, some of you may be familiar with. Uh, you may have had it in high school or you may have it in college. Uh, get some of these resources and keep them on your desk and look things up. So that's the first. The second is uh, I would recommend teaching. As soon as you enter into whatever your career path is, you will quickly begin to acquire sp special knowledge. You think now that you won't, but you already know some things many people don't. For example, there are many people that have no military experience. You already <coughs> have some. So you've already started to develop skills. It could be outdoor skills, survival skills, engineering skills. And my recommendation is to begin to teach as soon as you begin your career, at the earliest opportunity. If you're in the military and you get assigned somewhere, Call up the local community college and say, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good at whatever it is. Uh, can I teach a class? And as you progress, uh, you can end, end up teaching at anywhere, really. And you never really uh, uh, master something until you've taught it. You never really master it until you've taught it. So that's uh, the next thing. And the third thing is, uh, I did the teaching relatively okay. A year or two out of law school, I started to teach. But one thing that I didn't do, the third thing that I didn't do, is I didn't write and publish. Because who be it for me? Two years, three years out of law school, five years out of law school. I mean, probably everybody already thinks, you know, maybe what I think is obvious. But that's also not the case. You can shape and influence a broad discussion and engage in the public dialogue by writing and publishing. It could be for Marine Corps Gazette. It could be submitting something to, uh, as an opinion editorial to a newspaper. It could even be a top newspaper, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, or it could be a state newspaper. Uh, or you could write an article or even think about seriously beginning uh, to write a longer monograph. But I would recommend that you Think about and engage in the public square by writing and publishing. And don't, don't stop yourself if you have the inclination. Now, of course, it takes time. It takes, you know, instead of watching uh, Friends on Netflix or whatever, you would, you're going to have to, you know, do that on the weekends. Uh, but nonetheless, I think that you'll find it satisfying and it will, um, it will build on itself. People will contact you. You write one article on something or two articles on something, and suddenly you're perceived as an expert, and you'll start to get inquiries. Media will start to call you. And so that would be my third recommendation. Thanks. So at the risk of echoing everything they've said, I'll give some other observations. Maybe a bit of a different tact. First would be, when I look back, I wish I wouldn't have felt as shy as I did or reserved as I did when time came to ask questions. Second guessing, looking around a room saying, oh my gosh, everybody's probably smarter than me. I don't want to ask a question that's going to make me look less intelligent than everybody. Maybe I'll just sit here. And as I still feel that way often. I'm the first to admit that. I feel intimidated at times being on this panel, like butterflies in my stomach before getting up before all of you. That's all healthy and natural, but I think what I've learned is embrace that. See that it means I care, but put yourself out there. Ask the questions. It's an, I know it's almost uh, so simple for me to say, but if you have that question, chances are other people do as well. And you'll be the voice for some of those people who are too shy to ask it. Along with that, ask honest questions. 
questions that you don't already know the answer to, which is a form of grandstanding, I'll say, especially as Sam described, if you're going to go to communities and you're going to be, and I'm going to come back to relationships in a second, building relationships to people, you look and meet with a Gwich'in elder, they've had a lifetime of learning how to ferret out and be able to see through somebody who's a fraud. And if you go in with an honest question and they'll see your soul and see your heart through your eyes, if you're asking an honest question, you can make a lot of faux pas and small slips and things that, that may not be culturally, you don't want to do anything egregiously culturally inappropriate, but it will overlook because you're being honest and you're being humble. And if anything, if I could go back to some of my first experiences, I thought I had credentials that I've come to learn over time. Even now, declared in some southern circles as an expert, I know very well when I enter into rooms in the north, I am the least knowledgeable person in the room. Embrace it, own it. And my second point is be curiosity driven. One of the best pieces of advice I got from my doctoral supervisor was he said, Whitney, if you're interested in a topic, work on it because if you're interested, other people are gonna be interested or you'll make them interested in it. Seize that in whatever you're working on. Pick papers for each of your courses or assignments that you're excited about. It will help to get you through it. Convert that I will try to woo, I got it done, and to hopefully enjoy the experience. At the same time, you've got a wonderful environment here at Norwich University to embrace being multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary. I was trained as a historian. I love the tools that I built as a historian. But collaborating with colleagues in the English department has been eye-opening. Legal colleagues like James has changed the way I refine my language and I have to think about the implications of maybe what I'm suggesting. Working with geographers or anthropologists, and dare I say even more exciting, for those of you in the social sciences and humanities, working with your colleagues and having conversations with your colleagues in the physical sciences, in engineering. You've got a wonderful opportunity because of the wonderful spirit here and culture that you have here at Norwich University. Embrace it. If anything has transformed my approach to scholarship and where I fit within these conversations, it's realizing I don't need to know it all. Quite the opposite. I can relish and wrap my arms around what I don't know and know that there are really smart people who I can have conversations with. And then when it comes time to publish, sometimes it'll be co-published and we'll have already done that first round of peer review, which some of you may have heard about. The last, and I think Troy, your opening comments exemplified this much better than I will, so I won't go into details, is the centrality of relationships. It's the relationships you're building with one another that you're going to carry throughout your lives. It's those relationships that create opportunities, open doors, seize them where it's appropriate, where it's safe to do so. But also, if you have strong relationships, lots of strong arms around you, you can act on that motto, I will try. Try, that's what's being asked, that you don't always have to have it work out, right? Those of you in the sciences know an experimentation, a, an experiment that doesn't yield an expected result can sometimes be just as important as the experiment that does. If you've got relationships in place, you'll have opportunities, you'll also have strong arms to catch you or just help to orient you, to point you in directions. When you're taking those measured risks and being able to act upon that curiosity Right, ask those questions and embrace these wonderful different forms of knowledge and ways of knowing, which I think this panel hopefully is signaling and I'm, I'm learning from. So thanks. Wonderful. Some good advice if you're taking notes. All right, let's ask some questions. Please. Line up, uh, Russia, China, the Arctic, writing, leadership, now's your time. Good evening, is this on? Good evening, gentlemen. My name is John Piper. I'm a mechanical engineering major. Um, I wanted to ask questions about <clears throat> the possible industrialization and militarization of the Arctic Circle, like you said, uh, Dr. Kraska, the northern routes, like the Northwest Passage, are opening up um, more to regular nations without 
icebreakers or submarines to go through. Um, and the maritime law says that uh, the, all the countries with a maritime force can go through them, just like Dr. Uh, Lackenbauer said. But we saw in World War II and the Cold War uh, industrialization and militarization in hubs like Murmansk and Archangel and uh, the Vest Fjords and across the Bering Strait and Kamchatka Sea. But what would be the impact today? Like uh, with climate change and everything happening, you see hubs going up in northern Alaska or Norway, Sweden, or the Scandinavian countries, and how would that impact the native people like the Sami and the, uh, the Native Americans and Native Russians? James, I think this one's for you. <laughs> I feel like you were going to be ahead. Would you want me to go? I'll, I'll, I'll talk about, I'll talk, let me talk a little piece, one piece about it, about the, these, the industrialization and the impact. So, uh, you know, Throughout the circumpolar north, um, industrialization and uh, resource extraction has been problematic for indigenous people. You know, if you take a look at Norway, Sweden, you have mining interests that have pushed uh, the indigenous Sami people off their grazing lands. If you were to go to Russia, where the Nanette do their reindeer herding, it's in the Yamal Peninsula has pushed them off their prime reindeer herding lands. And um, you recently, we had, um, there was, uh, a spillage um, of uh, like 20,000 tons of uh, 20,000 gallons of diesel, um, you know, in one of the major rivers in Russia, and so the impact obviously there on the native people. So yeah, you're right. Every every time we have these, the Arctic is a very sensitive environment. It's very difficult to clean up. You know, I always ask people, would you rather do a cleanup spill of oil of an oil tanker in the Gulf of Mexico or up in the Chukchi? And they're like, I want to go to the Gulf of Mexico and drink Mai Tai while I'm watching this thing get cleaned up. And I want to freeze while I'm doing it. And so it's obviously very difficult to do that. And so, you know, it's, it's a complex question. I would say that over time, this is just my opinion, but it does appear that there is a kind of a, there are limitations in terms of what resource extraction will occur within at least the, the North American Arctic, so in the, in the US and Canada. And so you see, less development occurring within those territories or within that land. Um, within the Russian Arctic, I think is where we probably have more concern regarding the industrialization and impact on the indigenous people there. Um, the Russians do recognize environmental issues are issues for them as well, and so they're not as haphazard as they might have been in the past. But um, I, I would, I'd like to hear what you guys think. Thanks uh, for the question. I'll talk about just the, the governance piece of that, if I could. Uh, we, are, we live in a globalized world, and I don't think that in a major way that that will unwind. And the Arctic region is, uh, is part of the globe, and it likely will have more and more uh, relationship with global trade. And what I would suggest is that we work hard in a multilateral way to manage that trade and uh, freedom of navigation and overflight through international institutions. We've already done that to some fair extent through the IMO with the Marine Pollution Convention, which has an annex on CO2 emissions from ships. In January of 2020, they were tightened once again to reduce the carbon footprint of merchant vessels. So about 90% of everything that we, uh, that we trade with other countries goes by sea, 90% of international trade. And these Arctic passages may indeed be avenues for some of that. I don't think that you can stop that because we, as I mentioned this, this afternoon, we live in a, in a world in which the United States uh, and Canada is in an, an island, a continental-sized island, and we want and cherish our connections with the outside world. And therefore, we have to recognize that other countries also have uh, those rights. But we can develop rules and continue to strengthen rules 
such as Marple Annex 6. There's also the IMO Polar Code, which makes vessels uh, compliant with, uh, with areas in, that are ice infested or that are in the, the Arctic or Antarctic. And global trade by sea constitutes about uh, two and a half or 2.7 percent of carbon emissions globally. And that's for 90 percent of international trade, not too bad. It's about the same for international air travel, also about two and a half percent. So I think we want to drive that down and reduce the impacts while preserving <coughs> the trading relationships. Thanks. Sir. Stephen Gilman, Cadet Helen Hensley. Uh, why is China more willing to follow guidelines from the UNCLOS in the Arctic, whereas in the South China Sea, they tend to push that boundary, especially with their nine dash line? Very easy, and thanks. It's a great question. Uh, the reason why is because in the Arctic region, uh, China is a user of waters that are under other countries' jurisdiction. Whereas in the South China Sea and East China Sea, China is a coastal state and it, it's asserting jurisdiction over those waters and then not recognizing the same rights that it takes advantage of in the Arctic Ocean. Yeah, that's the central uh, dilemma. And of course, we have to hold China account to account for that, as well as other countries that have unlawful claims that would impede legitimate commerce or even um, peaceful military activities. If I can just do a quick follow-up and just playing off your question, one of the potential futures I see is seeing China behaving as an exemplar in the Arctic because, again, core strategic interests are involved as a user state where it could point the world to saying, why are you complaining about our behavior? Look at how conforming we are with a lot of your governance measures or how we are in compliance with international law in the Arctic. Why are you criticizing me? Why are you criticizing me? So I think we also tend to drift as strategic analysts towards illegitimacy, unfavorable patterns of activity when we might expect China as a legitimizing actor in the Arctic trying to also use the Arctic as a vector to legitimize its place in the world and hope that it deflects attention from unfavorable things that, that it would like us not to look at elsewhere. This is a perfect example of how you have to pay attention to the rest of the world in many ways in order to understand the Arctic. We can't just study the Arctic. So the South China Sea is providing this awesome example. And <coughs> the extent to it, it does apply to the Arctic, we need to know. Sir? Good evening, gentlemen. Cadet James Vaughn. Um, I just wanted to ask about like we've seen the like how how much traffic and whatnot and commerce goes through like the Atlantic and the Pacific. And y'all were talking earlier about how the Arctic is just like starting to become more of like a an avenue that we can explore. Do you think that the importance of us focusing on the Arctic now is just because it's opening up as a new frontier, or? if there's like another reason for why we should be focusing in on the Arctic now. So you want to talk a little bit about shipping in the Arctic? Well, I, I would say I'll, I'll throw out a thought How about that. I will throw out this thought to you, uh, to all of you to consider. Who is the Arctic most important to? What country is the Arctic most important to financially? economically, who is going to be going to be impacted the most in, you know, in the opening of any shipping lanes within the Arctic? And, and I would argue that's Russia. And so the Russians all have the greatest exposure within the Arctic when it comes to, to you know, the potential for, for a downside, really. You know, if something were to happen in, in, in Alaska, you know, Alaska, you know, we, I, I love my state, but we don't really contribute that much sometimes to the U.S. other than being an Arctic, you know, place. Um, so if something were to happen to the economy of Alaska, you know, it's not going to be a big blow to the United States. And, you know, if something were to happen, probably like the NWT or YT in Canada, they'd be like, well, you know, the Quebec Qua would probably be like, oh, whatever. <laughs> but if something were to happen, 
to you know the Russian Arctic in terms of their ability to really get resources out of there as a whole other story and I, that's something I would pay attention to so sir off of that um, when we were just talking about how China is kind of flexing its muscles in the South China Sea y'all were just talking uh, towards the very beginning when uh, you first started talking that Russia is starting to do the same thing um, how would the US like want to respond to that in terms of the uh, like Arctic law and whatnot? Well, we've responded to both Russia and China the exact same way by asserting our lawful rights to navigate and fly anywhere that international law allows. And if I could just add a, a, a useful idiom for uh, China is China's view is in the South China Sea with its neighbors is that what's China's is theirs, what's theirs is theirs, and uh, what's yours is also theirs, but they're willing to share yours. And that applies as well to the Arctic Ocean. So they would say, uh, China would say that what's theirs is theirs in the South China Sea and the East China Sea. And China is also asserting a right to share in the Arctic. And not just governance, but the resources. China claims that it's part of this Central Arctic Ocean Fisheries Agreement that has a moratorium for 15 years, but China is very patient. 15 years from now, there could be fleets of hundreds of Chinese fishing vessels in the middle of the Arctic Ocean. This goes to this idiom. What's mine is mine, and what's yours is mine also, but I'm willing to share yours. I think just a quick add on to it, when we think about fishing, or shipping, pardon me, as well, as James was just alluding to, ask questions when you're reading the literature, when it's vague on time horizons. There's a lot of literature that's out there that looks like it's scientifically based that I would argue is not, and I'm guilty of this too in some of my own writings. I'm opaque in what I am projecting when this is gonna happen. And also ask questions, what type of shipping traffic is changing? In the Canadian Arctic, I can say we've seen dramatic increases in shipping activity because it started with such a low number. Most of it's destinational shipping, arriving at communities for resupply or arriving at mining sites. We're not seeing dramatic increases in transit shipping going through what the United States considers an international strait. So again, wonderful opportunities for you as critical thinkers to go in and ask the questions of, do I need more information to assess when we should be anticipating this changing and how much lead time would the United States need if it required, say, infrastructure development on the north slope of Alaska? Developing capacity at the community level to be able to have locally based capabilities to respond to some of this. It's the lead times. I think we sometimes believe our own hype as Arctic experts, thinking that this shipping traffic is imminent. And I always say, read Billy Mitchell in the 1920s and read Wilhelm or Stephenson in the 1920s and 30s, talking about the Arctic as a new Mediterranean that was opening up to the world. A hundred years ago, and I don't think it's gonna be a hundred years before we see some pretty dramatic changes. I'm just not sure if we're gonna see them in the next five years, as much as Putin and the Kremlin would love to see that Northern Sea Route be picked up and be a major artery, which of course the Soviet Union and now the Russians have been trying to build for a century. I'm still skeptical about how quickly this is going to happen and whether it's still gonna take the form that we might be anticipating looking through a 2021 lens. We cannot bring up Billy Mitchell without the actual most important quote. Alaska is the most strategic place in the world. Different class, though. Thank you, gentlemen. Keep asking those tough questions. Good evening, gentlemen. Cadet Jack Brennan. Um, so Dr. Kraskow was talking about the um, China and how we should embrace its interest, its genuine interest in the Arctic. And um, in your talk earlier today, you were also discussing how they've been disregarding the United Nations Conventional Law of the Sea. Um, do you think it would be possible, and if so, do you think it would be wise to use our position in the Arctic Council as leverage against China to help fix some of those problems in the Pacific? Not specifically. Uh, I, I don't know if I would do that. I can't, I can't think right now of a scenario. But your idea, I do endorse, which is, during the Cold, if I could do an analogy very quickly, during the Cold War with the Soviet Union, the United States and the West linked issues that were unrelated, 
to Soviet misconduct. For example, we linked the, the liberal emigration of Soviet Jews into the West to whether the United States would negotiate on nuclear arms control. Totally different issues, but this is sort of what you're suggesting. And I do support, rather than, than just reacting to the latest Chinese misstep in the South China Sea, but linking Chinese and Russian misconduct to other areas of the relationship. It could be trade, it could be student visas, it could be some other element of the relationship. And it might be opposition to observer status in the Arctic Council, although that ship has already sailed. But it could be opposing uh, things more vocally. Uh, China's role, for example, in the World Health Organization, which I don't think anybody now uh, truly appreciates, um, you know, like, like we might have two or three years ago. So I, I think that there's linkages that could be made, and we should think creatively about how to impose costs in other areas, other than simply doing what we still will continue to do, the prior question, which is freedom of navigation and overflight operations and exercises. We'll still do those, but those are necessary, but they're not sufficient. So good idea on the linkage is exactly what I'm thinking. I think you just signed up for your next article, the term paper, whatever Sir. class. Good question. Thanks, sir. Sir. Um, Cadet Kofalino, and I have a question regarding uh, Russia's expansion of their northern fleet in Severomensk, as well as some of their northern Arctic air bases. In regards to the U.S.'s like, military intervention in the Arctic, should the U.S. be concerned? And if so, how will we count, counter uh, that military expansion? I, I think it's a great question. I may actually ask our moderator if he wants to comment on it after I make a few quick comments. I think it's definitely a source of concern. I think it's making sure we're situating the concern at the right level. I think a lot of the lion's share of those investments are big D deterrence, global deterrence, as Professor Bufard shared in his presentation this morning. It's situating it in that national defense envelope. We must be monitoring what's going on and then not only preparing, as when identifying any threat, with what capabilities are there but always being nimble in, in reading and questioning our assumptions about intentions. Russia will continue to project that this is legitimate, functions as a sovereign state to deter adversaries and to defend their sovereign territory. Defensive messaging. We all know dual use capabilities like we're seeing being developed in terms of port facilities, airfields now extending out along the Siberian coast in places that we haven't seen them for a long time or haven't seen them before are all things that could also be turned offensively and within Russian doctrine, and, and Troy, I'll defer to you, offense and defense are not categories the way we think about them in the West. We need to be attuned to this and, and constantly reappraising what this means. But again, not necessarily thinking that investments in the Northern Fleet means that we're anticipating Russian aggression in the Arctic Ocean. I'm looking to the North Atlantic. I'm looking to the North Atlantic and reimagining what can we borrow from our thinking during the Cold War about the Greenland, Iceland, UK, Norway gap. And what parts of that are still applicable and appropriate in the 2020s and will be appropriate as we might imagine the 2030s and 2040s, but what things do we need to rethink? And the creativity that we need as a whole of society effort, as a broad defense team that includes academics like all of you, we need fresh thinking about this to make sure we don't return to the conventional thinking that was established before, just because it's easy to refresh it off, blow the dust off, fit and float those plans. We need to get ahead of our adversaries. We need to get ahead of their thinking. We need to get inside of their decision-making loops. And we need to make sure that we can do what we've always done best, situate at the right level, and make sure we're not baited into engaging with them in terrain of their choosing. Excellent, thank you. Well said. You're really gonna have to answer, good job. We have a couple more minutes, so let's get through some questions uh, a little bit more rapidly. And then uh, we'll, we'll do a hard stop here. Then we'll uh, be glad to sit around and continue to talk after we have to stop for a moment. So. My name is Cadet Sigurdsson. Um, so my question is, what do you think is the most important language to learn today and why? I say Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yes, I think you should learn good chin. <laughs> I think English is the global language, so we already have an advantage, but you can perfect, you can perfect your craft, as I mentioned. And I think I'm just going to turn the question around and say, what we need is people who are interested in not only perfecting their English, but also learning other languages. That it's valuable. And I think sometimes because English is the lingua franca, that's such a weird turn of phrase, but because it is the global language in so many ways, we sometimes can get apathetic with the need to, to go through that exercise. I think it's good for our brains to be thinking and imagining thinking in other languages. Sam, I think you can speak to that directly, but it's even the approach of, great, encourage people, learn another language. It may be Russian, it may be Chinese, it may be Italian, but learn something because you're within this broader structure of relationships, you'll find a place to be able to exercise it, and that will be value added to your country and to our allied efforts. And I'd say this, and I wasn't joking when I said learn which end. The reason why I say that is because it's, it's a polysynthetic language. Chinese and English are actually very simple languages. They're called analytic languages. And so you have free morpheme. Basically, you can construct sentences out of these individual words. A polysynthetic language has 20 places with different combinations, eventually, that you can make into an infinite amount of words. And so it's significantly harder than Chinese, Arabic, Russian, or any of those other languages. So learn a polysynthetic language if you really want to challenge yourself. Last question, ma'am. Oh, another quick bite at the apple. I know we're, um, I, I would also suggest, I mean, any other language obviously is, is useful, but I would suggest that if you're interested, it, the reason I said English is because everybody in the world speaks English. There is one important country that really has a dearth of English speaking ability, and that's Japan, our, our most critical ally. And it's very difficult to engage with Japanese officials and scholars because they have such limited English ability. They're, they're just not speaking English like they are in China and, and even Vietnam. So that's another one to consider would be Japanese. Last question, quickly. Good evening, gentlemen. Cadet J.C. Harlow. So you talk a lot about ex or improving our English and getting better with writing. I know with the extent of my major, I'm exercise science, I don't write very much but I do have um, an enjoyment with journaling, but that's really all I do. Do you have any tips on how to get better with writing and um, things to write about or how to kind of start off, especially considering like a lot of us maybe aren't geared towards English majors or, or swap majors or anything like that? Thanks, it's a, it's a wonderful question. And I think the fact that you're describing journaling is, that's it, write. Doesn't matter what you're writing, write. Get into a habit of writing every day. None of us is a natural born writer. Some of us may be more naturally inclined to writing with some flair and artistry. It's work. It's a craft that you have to hone. It's writing. It's learning to revise. That dreaded editing when we finish pull that all nighter and get the paper done and we don't want to look at it again. If you can find that last hour of energy to do the read through and the edit and the crack, that's all part of writing. Find time to do it. The topic doesn't matter as much as people think. It's the practice and the routine and getting your brain trained to putting what used to be pen to paper, I still take notes because I like that exercise, tapping away on the keyboard, find a way to do it. And you're doing it in your reports. When you're doing your lab reports and other things, use those as opportunities and, and just seize them whenever you can. So that concludes this part of it. We have to end uh, at this point. Please stand by for your questions. I uh, hope to continue here in a minute. But ladies and gentlemen, please round of applause for this awesome panel. Thank you.